Welcome to The Struggle is Real, a show for 20-somethings that are trying to figure out adulting. I'm your host, Justin Peters. Each episode, we focus on solving a problem that we will face throughout this defining decade that wasn't covered in the classroom. This could include topics about our career, health, relationships, and money. Let's get into it. I feel today's episode is the perfect follow-up to my recent conversation with Jeremy Schneider. In that episode, we discuss how to easily invest your money in order to predictively grow your wealth. Today, I want to expand on that conversation. I know so many of us 20-somethings are focused on increasing our wealth and gaining more financial security. I'm definitely in this boat, and I think that's a wise approach. I'm confident that we will get to a place where it becomes less about making money and more about life satisfaction. I think today's guest summarizes it best. Use money to make a life. Don't use life to make money. Joining me on The Struggle is Real is Laura Rotter, founder of True Abundance Advisors. Laura's career is dominated by her 30 years of experience on Wall Street, but she spent the last six years helping individuals attain both financial security and life satisfaction through her own advising firm. Laura gives a lot of reflective advice on career exploration, how to go about pursuing a new life direction, and shares a technique to treat your personal finances like a business owner. After this conversation, I hope you walk away with thoughts on how you'd like to make meaning with your money. This is a personal question for each of us, and I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. As long as you've given it some real thought and continue to evaluate your line of thinking as you move through life, you'll truly live your rich life. Enough of me though. I hope you enjoy my conversation with the Wall Street exec, yoga instructor, and lifelong learner, Laura Rotter. Well, Laura, super excited to have you on the podcast. Um, we connected earlier, so I do know a little bit about your background. And of course, I had a lot of fun researching you. Let's start out. I know you went to college and graduated as an English lit major, and then you went on to work as an editor for a company that publishes business newsletters. You found yourself, you made a transition, I think, internally to a different department within there, and then eventually found yourself at a bank in their credit department. Let's start off with that in mind. Tell me about exploring careers um, and opportunities within inside of your career early on. So I always thought whenever I was in college that college was where you did this career exploration. And then when you got done with college is when you decided what you were going to do for the rest of your life. But now being 28, knowing, um, having a little bit of hindsight that your first decade of your career is really meant for career exploration. So how did you go about exploring career opportunities early on in your career? And if you were to give yourself some advice in the past, what would you tell yourself? Wow, very meaty question. Sorry, a heavy one to start with, but I figured let's get right into it. <laughs> so I have to start off with the fact that when I grew up, I think um, my father was an engineer, so I was probably a response to the fact that he was career tracked from the get go. He went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute for college. And so when it was time for me to choose college, the message I got from my parents and specifically my father is this is not career training. This is learning to learn. That's what college is about. I'm not sure that that was great for me because when I graduated from college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I um, was not a very directed 20 something. So I really do believe. And so that's the first response to the question. My second response is, plan, plan, plan. We all have plans. This is what I'm going to do first. And then it's, and um, that's not how life works. Um, it really is sort of a life is a creative journey and we never know how that first job out of college is going to lead to the next job is going to lead to the next job. Um, it evolves in ways we can't anticipate or know. Um, so that I graduated not only an English lit major, but an English lit major in the middle of a recession. It was very hard to get a job. Um, I was also the first child, so I was very responsible and felt that I have to find something. The first job offer I get, I'm going to take. 
And so that first job offer, I can now look back in hindsight and say, that was a learning experience. I learned about different businesses. I the, Some of the newsletters were um, about the beverage industry, about the auto industry. So it was a first step in you know knowing the business world out there. It was also a learning experience and that was sort of a sucky job. I, I had to Right. I had to um, I had a time card for 45 minutes at lunch and they would dock me if lunch went longer. And um, it in that way, it was not a pleasant work environment. And I think often our first jobs out of college are that they're on the one hand learning what it's like to get up and be in the same place every morning. And and uh, um, and those are important skills to learn, but it's not necessarily I think mo- nine times out of ten, it's not going to be your dream job. And um, so, if I I can l- only in hindsight, can I look back on sort of that job and then um, how I ultimately landed up um, at a bank? I mean, I, I ended up at a small middle market bank because I spoke. Uh, it was an Israeli bank, and I spoke Hebrew, and that's how I got the job. And it was only once I was there recognizing that given my intellect and given my skills, that being on a platform of a bank opening accounts for people was, you know, probably not the best use of my skills. And so I learned about the credit department. And that was sort of my first, my next step on this path that now I, I can see how it evolved. It's it's really funny how you actually make meaning of your your past experience, but so as you're kind of dancing around, so much of your career is dictated just on serendipity. It's it's getting an opportunity and then deciding to act on that opportunity and explore it further, or take some of those skills that you learned through that opportunity and translate them into a tangential path and and moving forward there. And I try to looking back now, I've been on this train of like telling some twenty somethings out of college now, like. Don't be afraid to just experiment and play and try these first five to 10 years of your career because you can get so much more done in terms of deciding what you actually want to do if you're on that route. And of course, like if you woke up or if you came out of the womb and you wanted to be a doctor and you've never, um, you know, moved from, from that line of thinking, go be a doctor. I don't care. But like so many of us, as you were, you were mentioning, we come out of college kind of knowing what we want, but in honesty, you're only exposed to like maybe two or three percent of the actual job paths that are out there. And it's not until you get into the real world do you realize, oh, I could maybe work in like the credit department and like analyze companies. That's interesting. <laughs> it's so true. I I think looking at my own 20-something kids, that there's sort of and and thinking of my own background and where I grew up in a relatively affluent area, you were either a doctor or a lawyer or an Indian chief. And um, like software engineer, you know, what is that? There's, um, there are so many different paths one can take and uh, be open to the evolution. Mm. Um, and I also want to add to that, that be open to relationships. Yes. Um, there are people who are more extroverted and that might not be a necessary um, skill to develop, like you just like people and you're always conversing and getting together with people. But I'm more of an introvert. And I think as I've matured, recognizing how important it is not again, not to have a plan for the relationship. I'm going to have lunch with that person because I, but just get to know people, keep in touch with people. And um, because if I look back on the career moves I've made, a lot of them have just have come from relationships. Mm-hmm. He never got a job from a headhunter. So, um, you know, I had a lot of relationships with headhunters, but I think it's the personal relationships that really make a difference yeah. in, in the evolution of one's career. It's interesting you mentioned that because I know... I heard you once say that one of the few regrets that you had about your career early on was that you didn't invest in more in, in relationships. And I'm not sure if you meant it from like a networking standpoint, but just from a deeper relationship, I think it sounded like from, from that response that you had, you were really caught up in the work that you were doing and being really excellent at that work and didn't necessarily spend as much time as you'd want to developing and deepening some of the relationships that you had. 
Um, it's interesting that you caught that, Justin. I, I think, too, I can on the one hand, there's a true justification. I was a working mom and had three young kids at home. And so going out for drinks after work was not necessarily appealing, um, nor was getting up early in the morning to meet people for breakfast. Um but I am aware that that was partially an excuse because I am more introverted and it's easier to say, oh, I don't have time to get together with people than to actually do it. And um, and I'm talking about personal relationships as well as um, work peer relationships in that they all take an investment of time if you're going to have true friendships. And um, and so you have to be willing to invest the time in those. Mm. So let's move into your career on Wall Street. So you spent 30 years working on Wall Street. So after the bank, you ended up moving into um, Wall Street. It seemed like you were a, a enticed by the excitement that was happening around Wall Street. So you describe your first, you, you kind of break it into three different segments, your first decade, your middle decade, and your last decade. Your first decade, you describe as doing something that you love and that work loved you back. Um, and that was that was really interesting framing on that. The middle third, as you were just talking to, you were this really busy working mom. So you were balancing both your personal and professional obligations. And a lot of your professional obligations came down to the fact that you needed to do this for your family and continue to work and support in that way. And then your last 10 years, you got some space to think about it and you reflecting back on it, really hated those last 10 years. The culture around Wall Street changed from these nerds to the uh, the frat bros, and you weren't excited about what you were doing or who you were spending a lot of your time with. So I want to take each one of those segments and maybe ask you a question about them. So let's start off with the first 10 years. And one of the most fascinating transformations I see in this is going from making $11,000 $11,700 <laughs> at your first job to, it seemed like right around the end of this decade, having your first seven figure career. So obviously you gained a little bit of flexibility and like the reduction of this like survival instinct by getting more money. Um, you know, now you weren't focusing all of your money on paying for housing and transportation and groceries, but you were allowed to spend on some other indulgencies in life. On that spectrum, was there a point where you felt like there was almost a lack of return, like similar to the concept of law of diminishing return? Such a great question about the money and, and what it meant to me. And I think in that, if we're going to think about that first decade, um, no, I mean, I grew up uh, in a family that struggled financially and um, I look at both my sister and I, who became the primary breadwinners of our nuclear families. So um, I know there must have been an unconscious message that it's important to earn money and, and that money is equivalent to security. Um, and I, so when I first started out, I don't think I... I remember thinking if I could just earn 25000 a year, that would be so much money. I had no concept of costs and expenses. And I, I didn't have a lot of needs. Um, so I didn't feel like, oh, when I was making $11,000, I didn't feel stretched. I remember feeling really proud of myself when I put money into sort of the Chris Mix account at the bank. And at the end of the year had a thousand dollars. Like it felt like so much money. I didn't feel needy. I didn't even feel needy as a kid. Um, I wasn't aware. And I think, look, our whole economy, the, the kind of wealth that we see around us, I don't think existed in the same way and certainly not as visibly when I was starting out. So I didn't have this concept that like, oh, I, I, I need to make more. It was just like, I'd like, I'd like security. And over that first decade, I was more focused on on going from being feeling like the nerd in high school to feeling like, look how successful I am. It, it gave me, um, it helped my sense of self-worth for better or for worse. I can now look back and say self-worth needs to come internally, but um, it, it helped. It was my identity. It helped me feel good about myself. Look, I'm good at something and I'm paid well for it. And, um, and then sort of unconsciously because I didn't work with a financial planner. So unconsciously, 
buying a bigger house and buying a vacation home and buying nicer things. I enjoyed it. And I wasn't so aware of how that might be trapping me into a lifestyle that I, you know, as you said, sort of that it's no longer additive. I didn't feel that in the first decade because in the first decade, I I enjoyed my job. I enjoyed my level of responsibility. And also interestingly, right, as, as someone, I guess in my thirties at the time, it was, it wasn't competitive yet. You know, like you had peers at work and you didn't feel like you were competing against them. You were all working and learning at the same time, there was this feeling of camaraderie and being part of something interesting and intellectually challenging. And of course, um, financial good financial remuneration. But I would say for the first decade, I, d- I didn't really sense the downside. Mm. Did you eventually get a feeling of competing with your colleagues? You almost made me feel like there was a later part in your career that there was this competition between colleagues. Yes, I think um, certainly in a lot of fields, someone once said to me, if you want to have friends at work, be a teacher. Um, (laughs) So I don't know that it's unique to Wall Street, but at some point um, I and and partially it was also my decision, if you will, that I didn't stay at any one firm for a while for a long time. I, I probably. Um, for that first decade was like every year and a half or two years, I was switching jobs. So to a certain extent, I was always um, proving myself. And on the one hand, so I would leave jobs and double my income. On the other hand, there isn't sort of the sense of stability that people know who you are and trust you. And um, so in your first couple of jobs, everybody's young and everybody's learning. And Again, that sense of being in it together Um, a decade later, it's, you know, who the hell are you and what are you bringing to the table and and what can you do? And um, that gets old after a while, especially as as you age. Um, You know, if I had it to do over, maybe I would have been more intent on staying somewhere for a while. Mm. Um, And I think the sense of not being appreciated, which always drove me to, you know, leave for the next best position. Um, Again, I can now look back and say that that's an internal sense. Um, But I always felt like, well, there'll be a better place where I'll be better appreciated. It's hard. So back to your original thought too, around self-worth and your income, I still struggle with that a lot right now. I think lots of 20 somethings, and I'm guessing most career working professionals probably struggle with this as well. Um, Maybe because a lot of companies struggle with appreciating their employees outside of what the annual raise and bonus looks like. I think that's like, since that's one of the few opportunities we get to gauge what our employer thinks of us, like that's what a lot of our self-worth is tied to. Um, I am fortunate to work for a boss that is very good at appreciating me outside of those things. We actually just had our annual review right before this call too. So I'm, I'm really <laughs> on a sense of great appreciation as well, but I, I don't know. I struggle with um, not having my, my identity or my sense of self-worth tied up in how much compensation that I make. And I feel bad, especially for like, you mentioned teachers too, like teachers are in this fixed matrix grid and the best to the worst, there's not really a big variance there. And I can see why so many great teachers end up leaving that profession to go seek some more worth and AKA some more money. Um, because there are some people out there that will throw the money that their way, but maybe there are some other ways that employers can appreciate you. I don't know. Well, it's interesting. There's so much being written now on leadership and being a good leader, which includes feedback and positive feedback because it's human nature to notice the negative and reflect on the negative and not so much the positive. In my experience, again, in my career on Wall Street, I was not at the larger institutions that maybe would have done this. I ultimately was at hedge funds. And what happens at hedge funds is that the person who starts the hedge fund is very skilled at investing not skilled at managing people. And then the hedge fund grows and they need to hire employees. Again, by and large, you're lucky if you have someone who's skilled at 
managing employees. Not that it's an easy skill, but um, so, um, you know, I didn't work for the greatest people. (laughs) Is that changing at all? I know you've been out of Wall Street for uh, um, like a half a decade now, but did you see any change or sense of change in terms of that in particular? Because I'm also reading these like JP Morgan headlines and all these banks that are like throwing more and more money at like the new associates that come on. And I'm just like, that's great. And we love that. Um, there's, there's a lot of great things that can, um, that, that, that a higher salary can do for us. But at the same time too, like, we just want to be told that we're doing a great job. <laughs> I think that's going to come down to each particular manager, um, especially like a JP Morgan is such a huge institution. Um, I followed the saga. I don't know if you did during, you know, the depths of the pandemic, a lot of deal making took place and Goldman Sachs, there were um, new Goldman Sachs employees. They put a PowerPoint together about how their life sucks. Um, but you go to Wall Street. <laughs> I don't know if you had any friends who graduated yeah. from college and got the you go to Wall Street because you want to make money. Yep. Like it yep. sort of struck me that like they're bitching about the hours. And so what what Goldman Sachs did was like hand them more money. But that's why you're there. It's sort of like a boot camp. It's like if you sign up for the Marines and then you bitch about the like you signed up for the Marines. What did you think? So it's the same thing. People who go to those training programs right out of college, they want to make money. Mm-hmm. And um, and there are certain kind of people. I'm not going to go into that, you know, because I was there. But, you know, so it preselects for actually. Uh, it pre-selects for people who want to make money or people who like have no idea what they want to do after college and they get the job. So like, what the hell? Let's see what this is. Yeah. And maybe to tie a bow on, on our whole thread here too, that that's another great reason to do all this career exploration as well. So much of it was not only what do I want to do for work, but like, what are my expectations of work? Like wh- who's the kind of manager that I want to work for? What's the kind of company that I want to work for? Is this to optimize how much money am I making? And do I want to balance between flexibility and the person I'm working for, the values my company holds, so much so much of that, you start to figure out and identify while you're working early on in your career. So once again, I just think that's another great opportunity for you to go and, and explore and do different things, especially through your 20s um, around career. But I do want to shift the conversation now to your middle decade. Um, as I mentioned, this was your, your busy time and this might be part of your answer to this question, but at some point in time in your career, you were told that you were going to make partner at the fund that you were at. And then not even a year later, you decided to leave that opportunity, leave that employer to go pursue a different opportunity. And you made an offhanded comment that you just didn't want the pressure. Um, and I'm assuming there was some, uh, some personal pressure coming as well. Can you bring me back to your yourself during that time frame and explain to me your line of thinking and some of the feelings that might have been a part of that decision? So I've spent a lot of time, though thankfully it's been, I have some distance from many years of being quite pained from having left a hedge fund that ultimately ended up making multi, multi, actually the head of the hedge fund. When I left, it was relatively small. He's now on the Forbes billionaire list. It was like five of us. It's now a multi-billion dollar fund. And um, everyone who was there when I was there is quite, quite wealthy. And so it took me a while um, to get, you know, to stop going over and over that decision to leave. Mm. Um, And part of what I'm, what you may be referring to Justin is realizing that it wasn't a mistake. I don't think we ever make mistakes. Like I still remember that what was important to me was like, can I wear jeans to work (laughs) or what time, you know, when I look at people who've been very successful on wall street, again, this is to our previous little conversation, they're driven by money. They're like, I have this capital at my disposal. What can I invest in? Who, what, what up? And and for me, it was more like, this is an interesting job. How early can I leave? Um, (laughs) What can I wear to the office? Like not to downplay my, but that wasn't who I was, this like empire. It's not who I am. And on some level, I must have known that unconsciously that I, I'm not looking to build an empire. I'm looking to have enough. 
And yes, I had very young kids and I was approached by a friend who ran a hedge fund that was closer to my home. I did, it wasn't in the city, it was in the suburbs and it had a little pond, I remember. And I thought, oh, the kids can come and we can eat, um, we can have lunch together around the pond. Like those were clearly the things that were important to me and not, you know, again, how much money can I make? And um, and I remember my husband saying, in retrospect, how helpful it was to have me more accessible. Um, I could not have foreseen that what happened is the hedge fund I left to join ultimately put itself out of business after a couple of years. I sort of, I had the arrogance to believe that, you know, I would never make less than a certain amount of money and um, hadn't occurred to me to think about those kind of things, which who is a better manager and who might have a longer um, time span in business. It was more like, oh, this will be an easier commute and um, and I could be near the kids. And um, for better or for worse, that's how I made the decision. And another, this is sort of a postscript, but this was my awakening moment So um, I left a pretty coveted job. I had been in charge of a particular kind of investment and I left it. And so he the hedge fund I left was recruiting a replacement and several people who were in the running reached out to me. Um, One of them, a lovely man, got the job. We we coincidentally a couple of years later bumped into each other. We were on vacation together and he kidded, you know, he was taking tennis lessons with my husband and he said, oh, I replaced his wife. I love not less than six months later, this gentleman, I still get chills when I think about it because I was still in the, oh my God, I get left so much money on the table. Not less than six months later, he was diagnosed with a virulent um, cancer and and he passed. Like we saw him in August and we joked and he died by December. And I think that was like the, the awakening. That was like, Laura, it doesn't matter how much is in the bank account. We're each gifted a certain amount of time on this planet and stop looking back with regret on leaving that position. It made me feel like maybe that was why, you know, I can be booga booga. Like, so his wife was left with resources that he wouldn't have had otherwise uh, um, after he passed. And maybe that, you know, like stop questioning how life evolves. We, we never, we don't really know. That is, that's tough and a really sad story. And you're right. I think um, I definitely want to explore that a little bit more. But let me ask you about your last decade. And I think this will segue into that conversation as well. So early on in your career, you created this identity for yourself that you were someone that was good at analyzing companies. And I remember early on in my career, I still a little bit of this as well. I'm like seeking a sense of career identity as well. Like I was just like, I got out of college and I'm like, I need to, I need to, you know, find that identity. And I kind of gravitated my first to my first job because I was successful there. And it took me when I was leaving that job, it took me a lot longer to leave that job because I really had to unravel the identity that was wrapped up in this company. And I'm good at this job and this profession. And these industry skills, that was a big challenge for me. And it seemed like that was a big challenge for you as well. I mean, you spent, you, you, you mentioned 10 years of really not enjoying what you were doing. So in terms of unraveling, there was quite some unraveling there. <laughs> you ran into a book called nine, 90 days to a new life direction. And we'll link it into the show notes for anyone that's interested, but there was a exercise in that book where you got to, where they suggested that you interview do like a career interview with three different professions. And you picked a yogi, a rabbi, and a financial advisor focused on women. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) knowing your background too, I can see why you selected each one of those. It's really fascinating. But if you had to run the experiment again, assuming that you had to pick three entirely different paths, what would you explore now? And were those were those fields on the original list and just didn't make the final three? Are they relatively new ideas? So it's, um, it's interesting. So rabbi for, um, I grew up in a part of the 
a very spiritual, I've always been a very spiritual person. And um, I grew up in part of the Jewish religion. It's probably true of all religions. We've all evolved. That was very um, male dominated. So I had people ask me when I got to college, I met many other people who were very um, tied into their Jewish identity and religion, but not as um, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it, sort of right wing is the way I grew up. And they would say, why didn't you become a rabbi? But that wasn't a choice that I knew was available to me as a woman growing up. Um, so I think maybe that would have always been, I mean, I wonder if I was born 20 years later or if there had, had that maybe been a path that I thought was available to me, but certainly um, I didn't know it to be available when I was growing I'm, up. I'm very ignorant to it as well. I was surprised. Yeah. I didn't even know women could become rabbis <laughs> until I was listening to, to a couple of your <laughs> podcast episodes. And I was like, oh, Okay, but once again, I'm very ignorant to that. <laughs> <laughs> so that, and that's probably true in many other religions, not just Judaism, that women have taken on greater and greater roles. Mm-hmm. Um, and yogi, I was relatively new to, but it's the same thing. I liked um, the spiritual teachings tied to yoga. I think when you had just asked that question, Justin, if I was doing another exploration, um, I might choose the same, the same careers in that I more and more am interested in infusing spirituality into, into money. Um, I'm very aware that just who I am as a person brings a certain vantage, you know, vantage point to the discussions. Uh, and I don't want to say struggle because I believe in letting my life evolve, but wonder how can I bring more and more um, right brain kind of exercises to the work I do? Because it's easy to fall into discussions of, you know, to spreadsheets and dollars and cents. Um, And I don't think that that's my value add. You know, everybody brings their particular skills, gifts, and personalities to the work they do. And I've always been aware of something. This is going to be a a Mel Brooks joke, that there's something greater than Phil. Um, You know, that there's something out there uh, beyond what we can see with our eyes. Mm. Mm. And so I guess that that brought that exploration up. And I do have to share um, and that that I did become a yoga teacher, that um, the rabbi, the exploration, the interviewing three people for rabbi made me well aware that people who go to rabbinical school love academics. Not that I don't like academics. I've always excelled at school, but the thought of going back to school wasn't that appealing and (laughs) not be that appealing now. Like I'm so, I remember like the last test I took and paper I wrote, I'm like, woohoo, I'm done. I feel you there. I feel you there. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so that wasn't so interesting. Um, but the yoga teacher training, I did I did two yoga teacher trainings, actually, and I enjoyed the people I met there. I think people on a more spiritual path have a, for lack of a better way to put it, a more magical view of life mm-hmm. um, that anything can happen. Anything's a possibility. Um and uh, and just the the teachings I, I found fascinating. And I did teach for a while, but mostly after work, I taught a bit while I was still at my my last Wall Street job, Citibank. And um, and I've actually it was just just somebody asked me if I wanted to teach a yoga class, but um, no longer. I you know you have to put your life in. I feel like you have to choose what you put your life energy into, and I chose one path over over the other. It was a fascinating exploration. Yeah, that is interesting. How'd you go about um, approaching the three people that you interviewed? Did you already know them? Did you have a relationship with them? How'd you pick them and, and approach them? So I approached my yoga teacher. Makes sense. Um, I wonder if I approached, I had several yoga teachers at the time, two yoga teachers in particular. So I might have approached both of those, but I can think there's a yoga teacher. Um, who is still in my life. 
She is also, so to show quite how boga boga I am, she's also an astrologist and, and a tarot card teacher. And I, I've um, studied both with her and she also just became a life coach. And so I've done some work with her as a life coach. So she remains in my life and she, I feel like is quite an important figure in my life because I, as I said, I was pretty spiritual as a younger child. And then um, I'm in a very strong 30 some odd year marriage. My husband is quite different than I. He, um, he doesn't believe that one can see beyond, you know, the, you know, the spreadsheet, the, he's a very science oriented guy. And um it was only through meeting this yoga teacher that I I was reacquainted with my more open spiritual self because I feel like I had denied it for so long, living such a pragmatist who I know to this day sort of thinks that some of my uh, interests and beliefs are uh, ridiculous. And I, I, I think it was important for me to be exposed and befriend people who have a different worldview. And frankly, I have to say, it's only now that I'm really embracing that other side of myself and not ashamed and um, hiding it. Hmm. And I feel like that's been part of my journey. That's interesting. How do you approach those conversations with your husband? Do you just stay away <laughs> from them? Have you pulled him any closer to to this nucleus? I, I'm kind of curious. What does he do for a profession? I didn't hear you. Mention it. He's an academic psychiatrist. Okay. So he doesn't see patients. He um he works with court systems for mentally ill criminal offenders. And frankly, he's been doing a lot of social justice work because you know we're so much more aware of how social justice ties into people who get caught in the criminal system, etc. So he does very, very fascinating uh work. And um, and I would say the one um the one movement he's made and he now thanks me, though I think it was my son, who's also a pragmatist, who um, made a competition out of it. But he um, started to meditate using, um, I'm going to blank on the name, but a very, very well-known meditation app. Um, and so that has, I would say, um, he's type AAA, like I'm type A, and he's always made me feel like I'm totally chill. And I think he's gotten over the couple of years that he's been meditating more laid back, but I, I will share, I haven't shared this on a podcast that so through um, this tarot, I took a class on tarot with this woman, Robin Wald, and she started off the first class by saying how the women and, you know, feminine beliefs, you know, women have been burned at the stake as witches, that any kind of out of the, the traditional mainstream thought has often been tied to the feminine and has been downgraded. And when she said that, I started to share more with my husband. I don't think he, I think it makes him very uncomfortable. I might say, you know, Mercury is no longer retrograde and whatever. And I know that he wants to run away, <laughs> but I used to not even share any of my thoughts. I don't know that it makes a difference. It makes a difference to me because again, there was this sense of sort of shame and um, I don't want to buy into that anymore. That's interesting. So. Do you explain his astrology to him and how you that might lead to your compatibility? <laughs> um, I again, I, I try, you try not to. Show, he's not at all interested. <laughs> what do you guys connect on? I, you, Thirty years is a long time. If there wasn't some common interest there and um, uh, overlap. <laughs> I, I cannot imagine you guys sticking together for 30 years. So what is it? What's your guys' things? We're both pretty driven people. We love, we just went on a, a ski vacation. We're skiers and hikers and bikers, and we've raised three wonderful children together and we share love for our dog. And, um, when you're together for over 30 years, it's like, there's a deep, deep history. Yeah. Um, that binds you yeah. together. The shared experience is really cool. Something that I am beginning to build with my girlfriend and it's very hard for me to 
see myself with anyone else, maybe because of those reasons. And similar to you and your husband too, we are very, very different in terms of our interest and what we like to explore with our free time. Um, but we seem to make it work. And the, the important thing too, is we align very well on values and the hard work, the dedication, the excitement about the future are all are, are three things that, that we both have in common. And you can find other friends to support your hobbies and your interests. She is not an athlete by any means. And I like to spend <laughs> most of my time outside of my, my nine to five in this podcast, outside rock climbing, soccer, volleyball, et cetera. I have an entire friend group that supports me there and I can spend time with. And um, she is like this movie lover and enjoys like exploring, like she knows I'm, I'm going to butcher this. So don't, please don't, don't um, come at me. But like, I think it's the Grammys that are happening right now. That's related to like the best picture and all of that. Like, no, 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 no. That's the Oscars. Oscars. Okay. Okay. I don't, I don't know, Laura. Um, anyway, those apparently came out here in the last couple of weeks and all yes. the nominations are out and she is now binging all of the uh, best picture nominations along with like, she, she, she pretty much has a goal every single year to make sure that she's watched all the nominations on the Oscars. So yes, that is not my thing. I'm like, I'll sit down and watch a movie with her, but then I get antsy after a while and I find myself like up and about <laughs> doing chores around the house or like trying to do some stuff, but we, we, we make it work. And I think um, ultimately it comes down to, to shared values. And I loved, I know this isn't a podcast on marriage advice, but it's really important to remember, Justin, as you said, that there isn't one person who's going to fulfill every need. Hmm. Um, it's sort of like a, a Hollywood fantasy, yeah. right? And uh, it's just not true. Back to our discussion about m making time for relationships with friends. Yes, no doubt, no doubt. So I, I love that thread that we went off there, but let's get back to the conversation <laughs> as well. So you mentioned Yogi, you explored the rabbi, but we didn't talk about the very last one, which was this financial advisor focused on women. Ultimately, that is what you chose. And um, you you had a little bit of a path to get to your own individual practice, but you do now run True Abundance Advisors, your individual practice focused on women, but I know you support couples as well. And that, tell me a little bit about abundance, why you chose the word abundance. I guess as, as um, we've discussed my, my career evolution, I do think, um, which is not unreasonable for people out of college, as we've said, like it was about money. How much money can I make? Money for me definitely represented security as I, you know, learned that growing up. And so I must have felt it in my cells that like my parents would have to choose which bill they were going to pay and um, a lot of financial instability. And so it was important for me to make money. And then, as we've said, it was important for my sense of self-worth to make more money and take nicer vacations. And then I realized that that's not that important. I think that's part of just growing up, if you will, that, wow, like when his name was Alan Cohn. When Alan passed away, realizing like it doesn't matter that Alan's bank account is bigger than mine, he's not here anymore. Mm. There's more to life than just making sure that you have more and more and more and more. And um, and I feel like as I watch the messages from Merrill Lynch or you know, all the wealth managers that it's about what's your number and we're going to help you get to your number. And I spoke, you know, when I informational interviewed with people who were doing financial advisory work, financial planning work, I'm thinking of there's a whole segment of my industry, which I'm very involved in called financial life planning. And they said, you know, it was people who are do already doing it for 20 years who said, so I've watched myself grow my clients wealth and they retire and they're miserable. You know, they don't know who they are. They don't have a sense of of what interests them and what they want to do with their time, that it doesn't matter that I've helped them build a larger and larger nest egg. They're not happy. So part of the work has to be what truly makes you feel like you have abundance because just a large number in your bank account. Um, I love the story and I've, I've shared it 
um, before of this picture of a huge yacht and, and the man who owns the yacht is lying on his chase lounge. There's a sunset and um, person working on the yacht brings him a drink. And the question is, who is looking at the sunset with a sense of satiation and calm and abundance and who's the one racked with anxiety going through the to-do list and what needs to get done? And we don't know the answer. You know, we're all tempted to say, oh, of course it's the it's the it's the dude drinking, <laughs> drinking the pina colada, but nine times out of ten, it probably isn't. Yeah. Um, so I feel like my work, and it's not easy work because there's a lot of anxiety around money. Um, everyone who comes to me, no matter what their bank account is, is anxious about money and wants help with getting the organization and clarity to lessen that anxiety. Um, but my work is to take the discussions beyond the money, you know, beyond the how much can you make for me and how much will I have next year and how much do I need? Of course, it's important questions to answer. Um and I want to broaden the discussion beyond just the dollars and cents. Yeah. And, and you do that really well, of course, as you mentioned, with the tactical piece, but you do have some of these questions that you like to ask your clients, especially early on, so you can get a sense. And I know one of them I wrote down here was what makes you come alive and how can that money support you in that? Um, I love that question. Do you have any other question, favorite questions that you ask clients? Well, I always have my first client meeting. So this is beyond I do a 30 minute screening call to just to make sure there's a sense that there is a good fit. But my first meeting with um, someone who's interested in becoming a client, I, I ask, why is money important to you? Or what about money is important to you? And one of the reasons I like that question is just to to give people a sense of what this relationship will be like, because they're anticipating, you know, do you need my account statements? <laughs> and um, How much money do I earn? And what's, what do I have saved? And all the, all the questions that any financial advisor would ask. Um, but I want to make it clear that we'll have other, that we'll have conversations beyond that. And, and, I was going to say if someone has difficulty answering that question, but of course that that um, uh, as you and I have discussed, I do. I have taken several courses on deep listening. Um, there are some people who are talkers, but you can get someone who asks, who just answers, "Oh, security," and then the 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 skill or the challenge is to say, "Well, what does security mean to you?" Or was there a time where you didn't feel secure? Or what do you imagine security will feel like? Or, mm. you know, to take it beyond the like, oh, thank you, security. Now I got it. Let's go on to the next thing. Um, mm. And to see how open the person is to that conversation. Um, I, I have said I've, I have a relative who, when I named the firm True Abundance Advisor, said, I don't know what that means. And I said, well, you're not my target client. Um, so I I love everyone I work with. I have the greatest clients. And and I, I feel like I screen for that. Mm. Um, you know, I, I want to work with people I enjoy. And I want to work with people who would enjoy working with me. So, um, you know, as an example, if someone says, you know, what's your performance and have you beaten the market? And, you know, it's like, first of all, that's not my intention. It's interesting because my background was investing and I know other people who have left, you know, institutional Wall Street and hung a shingle out. It's because they still want to manage money and they want to do it for individuals. And my money philosophy is let's keep fees as low as possible and diversify um, in low cost funds or exchange traded funds and put a plan in place based on who you are and what your goals are. And we're not going to change that plan for, you know, an infrastructure, build back better passing or not passing. We'll change that plan if you tell me, you know what, I just lost my job and I need to, but 
So if your life changes, we'll change the plan, but we're not doing tactical trading based on news that's coming out, which is, you know, very different than what I used to do for institutions, which is all about beating the market. But that's, you know, I, I that's not for the people I'm working with. Mm. Yeah, that is a very timely thought because the podcast episode that will be coming out right before yours is an individual called Jeremy Schneider. And he is a big believer in just low cost index fund investing, um, especially for the everyday consumer, because the only predictable thing there is how much you're going to pay for fees, not necessarily the performance of any certain fund um, or individual stock or any asset class. So yes, very, very timely topic. I do want to grab one piece of financial advice from you right before we we conclude this conversation. You have this interesting concept of looking at your finances like a business. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Um, sure, I'd be happy to. And it's really especially relevant for people who are, you know, in the first decade of working, especially I'm in um, Westchester County, which is a commuting suburb of New York City, quite an expensive city to live in. And um, I, when I'm working with someone or working with my kids and their friends, I tell them, look at the overhead you put in place. Look at the expenses you have in place that you have to pay for, even if you decide to sleep the entire month. Um, and ideally, and I say ideally, because in a place like New York City, it, it's not always possible, but ideally you look at what gets deposited in your bank account each month. So that's your paycheck net of all the taxes you pay, um, the premiums you're paying towards health insurance, et cetera. And frankly, even if you're say, putting some money towards your 401k, which you should, um, at least the amount of your match, what's deposited in your bank account each month. And ideally all those fixed expenses, your overhead, similar to a business, are not more than half of that paycheck. Um, if they are more, and frankly, when I first left Wall Street and you know hadn't got my overhead down, my overhead was almost 80% of what I was putting in the bank. And that doesn't leave any room for fun and savings. You want, you don't want to feel choked. If you're paying too much on rent or you've got too many recurring expenses between Netflix and now Apple TV and Hulu and all these subscriptions that you sign up for and you don't even realize. So I really tell everyone, go look at what you're paying for each month, your cell phone bill, your car lease, your rent or your mortgage, and try to keep that not more than half so that you can save an additional 10 to 20 percent of what's coming in each month. You want an emergency fund that gives you at least at least three months of your expenses and ideally six months of your expenses if if you are, you know, not a tenured professor and, you know, probably nobody is. So just in case you lose your job or you blow your tires or your roof leaks that you're not suddenly whipping out a credit card with a 25% interest rate to pay these things. So you want to be saving 10 to 20% in addition to your 401k contributions. And then in between, you want like 30 to 40% for fun. Um, so you can go to the movies and you, so you can buy that new pair of shoes. Um, and, and the 10 to 20% of savings uh, is also towards like, you know, you want to take one big vacation a year, or you know that you like to buy Christmas gifts for everyone. So you're saving towards those things so that, so that you're not suddenly choked and putting money on a credit card to take your vacation or something. So, and the overhead is harder you know, that will change over time. You might say, oh my God, I my overhead's too high. So I'm going to start exploring moving somewhere else. Um, so that's a, a slower change. But the fun thing for people I know that really have no idea what they're spending and each month might end up with some credit card debt, I say, you know what? Let's make a separate account. Let's figure out how much you want to spend each month. Let's say I'm just going to pick a number. Let's say a hundred dollars a month towards fun. Well, that means you've got twenty five dollars a week to spend on fun. Doesn't sound like a lot, but if you really need to track it, you have an automatic transfer from your checking account to a separate account 
of $25 each week, maybe keep a cushion in there so you don't overdraw it, and then only take out cash or use your debit card. So you can really see, oh my God, it's Wednesday and I've spent 20 of the $25. Um, I frankly have put that in place for me um, when I first left Wall Street and need to needed to be aware because I wasn't conscious. I I knew I had enough money. I would, oh, there's a sale. I'm going to go buy a sweater. And, uh, and my whole behavior has changed. And it's very hard nowadays, frankly, because with ads on Instagram and you're you don't even realize you're like you've put your thumb on your on your phone and opened it up and you've paid for something. Yep. It's so we are constantly enticed. I I mean, frankly, I keep telling myself unsubscribe. I get texts from shoe companies. We're having a sale. It's so hard. We're constantly have to challenge ourselves not to spend. Mm -hmm. And so having a system in place, if you know that you have a tendency to overspend so that you can see on a real time basis, you don't have to spend on an hour on Sunday looking at your credit card bills, but on a real time, you can. And I know I never want to I say to my clients, it's not like uh, you can't spend it. I just want you to be mindful. As you look at that pair of shoes, I want you to look look and say, you know what? I've spent my $25. I'm going to spend, I'm going to buy those shoes anyway. But you know that you're making that decision. Yes, agreed. But so many of us are mindless spenders. It's it's all one big bank account. The money comes in, the money goes out. You have no idea. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Um, and all of these corporations are not making it easier uh, for us either. They're actually removing the friction. Like Amazon's got like the one click shopping where all you got to do is add it to the cart and then you're one click away from buying that purchase. So I love to put a little bit of friction in between me and those, like not saving my credit card to the file. So I know I have to go over to my other room, grab my wallet, come back out here, put all my credit card information. And in that time of processing, I might rethink that purchase. So that's a really great call out, Laura. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. I know if people want to connect further with you about your financial advising and planning services, maybe they connected with your methodology and that you are true abundance advisors. That is with an O advisors with an O. Um, you can find her, her website, trueabundanceadvisors.com. That'll be in the show notes too, if you're on the run right now and, and you can't write that down. And, and Laura loves to get connect with people on LinkedIn as well. So feel free to, to find her on LinkedIn. That's Laura Rotter, um, last name, R-O-T-T-E-R. -T -T -E Once again, we'll have that in the show notes. Anything else that you'd like to share or point people to? I think I, I want to leave with the message that, of course, money is important. We live in a society that depends upon money. And... Um, and being organized and having clarity about your money is important. But as you make life decisions, really tune into who you are, what makes you feel abundant, what makes you come alive. And don't only make decisions on the basis of money. Hmm. There needs to be an understanding. Yeah, agreed. Let me ask you one final question, Laura, here. Um, if you had the opportunity to teach a 16-week class to a group of graduating college seniors on a topic that isn't normally covered in the classroom, what would you teach and how would you teach it? It's an interesting question because I find Justin um, personal financial literacy is not taught in the classroom. Agreed. <laughs> um, I actually volunteer for an organization in the New York area called My Money Workshop. And um, I have been leading workshops and answering questions of um, uh, graduating high school seniors. And it's elementary information, but like, what's a credit card? What's a debit card? What's a credit score? How much should I spend on rent? Um, these are basic questions that we have no idea. Nobody talks to us. I grew up, right? I thought $25,000 would be a hell of a lot of money to earn. My parents never talked about money. Mm. Um, so I think it's important to, um, to educate 
high school high school students on on money you get your first paycheck right you you think you're making x amount of money you get that pay stub you're like what where did it all go and one of the things we teach is like this is what a pay stub looks like and you're going to be paying federal taxes and state taxes and um putting money towards social security and you know nobody has any idea um we're supposed to just know from thin air, right? We had a little digression. It's the same thing with relationships, but, you know, I don't know that that's my area of expertise, but I'd be, I'd love to teach a course on um, financial literacy for high school. Agreed. That is why it is a pretty consistent topic on the struggle is real here, because it is something that I know so many 20 something struggle with because it was not talked about enough. At best, we took one semester of a personal finance course that taught us how to write a check. That was like the extent <laughs> of what I remember from high school and no opportunity to really explore it any further in, in college outside of maybe some of my accounting classes that came at it from a enterprise standpoint, but not necessarily a personal standpoint. So um, it's always a blast having people on like yourself that can come and share some wisdom and hopefully help some 20 something. So Laura, it has it been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Justin. Likewise. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you like this conversation today, be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified about new episodes. If you want to connect with me, send me a message on Instagram. I'm at Justin Lee Peters. You can find show notes with links to everything we discussed today at justinpeters.co. This episode was produced by Gabby Dimeke. I'm your host, Justin Peters. Thanks for tuning in.